Hi, thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Phil Wells. Um, uh, I'm from New Jersey. I have two little girls at home. And I'm a software engineer in test uh, for the New York Times web games team. Um, not a speaker by any means, but we'll see how it goes. Um, so the, the composition of the games team at the New York Times, uh, I work for the web team within the games department. We also support um, uh, iOS and Android apps, native apps, um, and we are agile teams. So um, in addition to our developers, we also have uh, software engineers and tests, and um, backing up all three of our platforms, we have a, a team of manual QA uh, that handles exploratory testing and some of our regression testing. Uh, so we support the New York Times crossword, of course, which has a lot of subscribers. Uh, the New York Times digital crossword has more subscribers than all the newspapers in Austin uh, have subscribers put together, uh, which is great for the crossword and might be not so great for the state of local news, but it is what it is. Um, in the past year, we supported and updated uh, features in the New York Times crossword, and we also released new games occasionally. We're working on uh, making more puzzle games for our solvers. Uh, last year, we released a game called Spelling Bee and another game called Letterboxd. And actually, Spelling Bee is free to play for this week, so if you're tired of hearing me talk, you can go to nytimes.com slash crosswords and bring up the Spelling Bee played for free today. Uh, it's an anagram game, if that's what you're into. Uh, one of our themes for the work we did last year was removing shame, which is a funny, uh, emotionally charged kind of theme for a software development team. Uh, but the crosswords, as we mentioned before, get progressively more difficult through the week. You could do a Monday crossword, and it's a walk in the park, but by the time you get to the end of the week, you feel worse about yourself, right? <laughs> it's not always so easy, and there's a reason for this. We want to include new solvers, and we want to include expert solvers who really enjoy the more devious puzzles. Uh, but one thing we hear all the time is, oh, the New York Times crossword? I don't even do that because I know that I can't do the more difficult puzzles. And uh, that feeling is shame, right? That, the feeling of associating uh, negative connotation with uh, not being able to complete a puzzle is not great. We, we don't like that people don't want to do our puzzles because they feel ashamed. It feels gross. It, uh, we want you to feel good and have fun. Um, let's shame more game, as we like to say. Uh, so we took on a couple of initiatives to make solving more enjoyable for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday solvers like myself. Uh, a couple of things we did, we introduced these milestone animations here on the right. Um, if you get halfway through a puzzle, you'll get a little firework animation and it'll say you're halfway there, so it's very encouraging for you. Uh, we introduced vertical streaks. Uh, for a long time, if, you've, if you'd completed, say, 10 crossword puzzles in a row, you'd be told that your streak is 10 puzzles. Um, we instituted these vertical streaks so that if you complete, say, four Mondays in a row, you get that message, and it's another way to build up your progress and feel good about your experience. Uh, we also introduced auto-check, which is controversial. Some people think this is cheating. Um, I think it's great. Uh, Auto-check, as you fill in the puzzle, uh, it'll let you know if the letters are wrong. Uh, there was an episode of the podcast, Judge John Hodgman, where he ruled that using auto-check is fine because it's your puzzle. You can do it however you want. Um, so I needed to come up with a theme for this talk, and it occurred to me that software development and software delivery is itself a kind of puzzle. And what we do, test practitioners, is uh, we do work to alleviate the shame that could be involved in delivering software. Um, shame can take the form of regressions that are released to production, but shame could also take the form of bad test cultures. You have too many tests, or tests that fail all the time or flake out. Um, you could have tests that you've written, but they never run, or uh, tests that are so slow that nobody ever wants to run them. Um, okay, here comes a metaphor. You're gonna have to bear with me. Uh, so when you feel this shame in your development process, who are you gonna call? The shame busters. I was told that I need to unify my talk with an overarching metaphor, and I came up with shame busters. Their names are responsibility, running often, reliability, and really quite fast. I just wanted it to start with an R. 
Your tests need to have these qualities. Um, if, you're, if you find your test culture lacking, your test systems are not being used, um, you, this is a prism through which you can uh, look at your test culture. So let's uh, run through them and how we uh, try to tackle these uh, important facets at the New York Times games team. Uh, first of all, responsibility. Who's responsible for the tests on your team? Uh, I posit that in a healthy development team, everybody, every developer on the team is responsible for creating tests and maintaining tests. Um, it, I've been on teams where we've said things like, I can't read the test code, um, the, uh, or the QA guy is out, I guess we're just not going to write any new tests today, and uh, you know, test code is uh, too opaque for anyone to possibly understand it. And it, that's a shame feeling. When you're saying those things, it doesn't feel great, right? And you want to be able to fix that state that you're in. Um, there's this pernicious myth that web developers couldn't possibly understand what we do as test practitioners. Uh, the page object model is this arcane mystery that no web developer could possibly ever grok. And, uh, uh, it's, it's not true, right? Uh, web developers didn't go to school for web development. Generally, web developers know how to code, just like we know how to code. It's all code. Uh, anyone can write these tests. Um, it, the idea is everyone on your team needs to be able to read your code, um, not just the software engineer and test, and if the developers are writing test code, then not just the developer who wrote the code. Uh, every engineer on the team needs to be fluent in the code that we're writing. And that includes yourself six months in the future. Um, uh, so you can't test everything end to end. A big knock against readability of code is volume. If there's too much code, then uh, no one's going to want to try to read it. Angie Jones gave this great talk last year about uh, what we should automate. And I really took it to heart. And she laid out her motivation at the beginning of it. You don't want to write end-to-end -end test code for every feature and capability and component in your product uh, because they'll break all the time. It takes too much time to do it, and you, your time is valuable. Uh, and there's too much noise in the results, especially if the tests get flaky. Um, and of course, it, if it's just too much code, your developers are going to start to ignore it because they think they have better things to do. This is, I have two little girls at home. I mentioned that, right? I have a favorite pony, Rainbow Dash. So on, on the games web team, everybody writes tests. Uh, we made test coverage part of our definition of done, and new features and new games that we release go out with 100% unit test coverage, whether that be uh, just unit tests for the uh, you know, reducers on game logic, or component tests. We make sure that the uh, coverage reports um, which of course aren't a perfect monitor of how you're uh, testing your features, but we make sure that those reports are green. Um, coverage gaps are handled uh, either during the sprint where something is shipping or they're prioritized in the backlog, uh, just like other production code would be. Uh, and we found that when everybody's writing these tests, um, the, the gaps are known, right? Uh, if you're the developer who wrote the unit tests and you also are uh, cognizant, you wrote the end-to-end -end tests or you're working with a software engineer and test to write those end-to-end -end tests, you know where your gaps are and you know what can't be covered for, by further unit testing. Um, so the practice of getting everyone on board involved um, engineers writing tests at every layer. So you know, we typically think that uh, testing, if you're a developer, uh, begins and ends with unit testing. At least it begins with unit testing, um, but it, it can go further. If we're gonna push the test practices to the left of the software development lifecycle, then that's where the developer sits. <laughs> so they're gonna need to take on some of that work. Uh, and to get them on board, we, uh, we do mob programming sessions where uh, people write tests together in a big room. We pair up, uh, and the software engineer and tests on the team acts as a uh, player coach. So uh, my, part of my responsibility, of course, is writing tests and working on the test infrastructure. But another big part of my work is answering questions for the developers, pairing with them, and uh, you know, getting them through the, uh, the process of writing tests on their own. Because when anyone can write a test, anyone can read the tests. And you've got this canon, this lean canon of uh, coverage that everyone knows what's going on. Um, if it breaks, anyone can fix it, and anyone can onboard a new team member and tell them that this is how we do it around here. Uh, so you can take that shame that you felt 
about having unreliable tests, consider it busted. See the metaphors back. You saw it. Uh, so the tests need to run often, and we need to report on the results when they run. Uh, there she is. So um, I've been on teams where we say things like this. We have tests that um, maybe we run with the push of a button. We're running them whenever we want to, ad hoc. Or they run, and no one's recording it. It's, uh, the results are falling into a black hole. Or um, we are recording, but we don't, we're not reporting correctly. We don't have the right parameters around all this data that we've built, and we don't know how to tell people whether our tests are helping us or not. Um, running tests often means hooking them up to your continuous integration pipeline. Uh, first, it means you need to be using continuous integration. That's a great practice. Um, uh, at the New York Times games team, we uh, hook our tests up to continuous integration, or end-to-end -end tests, and we run them on Sauce Labs to uh, cover a bunch of different browser and OS combinations. Uh, we use GitHub hooks to run uh, a slimmer suite of end-to-end -end tests in uh, headless Chrome instances, and our reporting is primarily uh, through Sauce Labs analytics dashboards. We also use our report portal dashboard. Uh, we just started using it this year. Uh, you might have seen they have a booth upstairs with the vendors. Um, so how often do we test at the New York Times? Uh, the, I don't know if you're gonna be able to read this, but uh, I'll just, uh, I'll narrate. You'll be fine. Uh, so when a developer opens a new PR branch and they push to that PR branch, the unit tests run at that point. And at, that's also the first time our end-to-end -end tests, so it was more like a smoke test suite, were run in uh, headless Chrome. Uh, once the merge occurs, a PR has been approved, uh, and the PR, by the way, includes a review of all the test code on the branch. It's merged, and that's when uh, unit tests will run again, and also end-to-end -end tests will run on Sauce Labs, and that's our, um, that's our heavier regression suite. So we're running those tests in parallel. It runs pretty quick. You know, uh, the scale of our tests is not on the thousands. It's on the scale of uh, the hundreds, so it... Uh, a full end-to-end -end regression test running massively parallel will take us about uh, eight to 10 minutes. Uh, during this time, our QA team and our product ownership team, they will do exploratory testing just to manually validate the new feature. Um, then we push to prod and unit tests run again. And we don't do any functional testing really once we go to prod. We rely on observability and, uh, uh, and customer feedback to know that we've done a good job. And, Really, we, uh, we don't experience a lot of bad production pushes because of the amount of testing that we're doing uh, at the beginning of our software development life cycle. So we run our tests pretty often, and every time the end-to-end -end tests run, they're getting reported. So we have a bunch of data that we can look at, and we really like the Sauce Labs analytics dashboards because it'll, it helps you pinpoint your flaky tests and also your longer running tests. Uh, and those are the tests that you, you know you need to work on. Those are, these dashboards are pointing you to where your test tech debt is. Uh, so it's important to uh, report back on your tests. Uh, and so uh, the shame that you felt uh, about not running your tests often, the shame that we felt at the New York Times games team has been busted. Uh, reliability. Uh, oh, I just noticed I misspoke before and said the word reliability instead of responsibility. I'm gonna edit that out. Okay, so reliability, your tests, you don't want them to be flaky and you want them to have high fidelity. You wanna know if a test is passing, it's passing because the application actually works. Uh, you could have tests that fail all the time. You, uh, a lot of times it's because something outside of your, the system that you're testing has gone wrong. Um, you, might have, you might use test accounts uh, and you've got this uh, pool of test accounts that you use, they have data set up in them, but then somebody logs in with that test account and solves a crossword. Oops, the state of that test account is broken. Uh, the API can be down and you can't test on your test environment because you're not getting any integrations. Uh, you could have way, way more end-to-end -end tests than you do unit tests. Um, you might feel shame about these things. Here's the famous uh, test case pyramid. Some people love it, some people hate it, but you, um, they told me I'm required to include it in my talk. Everyone who talks at SauceCon has to talk about the test case pyramid. The idea is, you want, of course, you want uh, more unit tests than you do UI tests, because unit tests are fast and cheap, UI tests are slow and expensive. That's, uh, that's the lore around that. Um, so we, uh, we try to hold a practice of constantly pushing tests down the pyramid. We have UI tests, we have end-to-end -end tests, 
um, but we don't fall in love with them, right? We, uh, we try to focus our UI tests to only cover things that we know are not covered by uh, unit tests and component tests at the lower levels. Um, this, there's a great paper by, uh, I'm gonna mispronounce his name, Ham Vok. It's on the martinfowler.com. He goes through a, a practical use case of the, uh, the test pyramid. The practical test pyramid is the name of the article. I highly recommend you read that. Um, but essentially, uh, a few of the things he says are, if you do see a failure uh, in your application that's caught by one of your UI or end-to-end -end tests, that's a sign that you need to decompose that test. The testing for that feature that broke needs to be done at the unit level or the component level because it's vulnerable. That's a, you've introduced risk and you've seen it and now you need to address that risk. Um, when you're writing a UI test, you need to make sure that it's providing value. This is, uh, when we were talking about who's responsible for these tests, the biggest gain that you get by everybody writing tests is the developer in charge of the feature knows where the value is. They know um, unit testing on this new component is very strong, but there's a little gap here that we're going to make sure to cover in our end-to-end -end tests. Um, they have to be valuable because they're not free. End-to-end -end tests especially are expensive. They're paying test practitioners to write and maintain these tests. Uh, so if you write them and they fail and you don't even care about the failure because you know that it's covered somewhere else or the test is just flaky, who cares? You're burning money. Uh, and you can't fall in love with these tests because one of these days, you're supposed to kill them. <laughs> You, you need to constantly be breaking apart these tests and turning them into unit tests and component tests. Uh, even the cool ones that you do a crazy database trick and use the API, you gotta kill those tests. Um, so I'm gonna delve into a couple of tools that the uh, New York Times Games web team uses uh, to up the reliability of our tests. So user management I addressed before. Um, user management is key for, um, you can imagine the crosswords. You have to log in and solve some crosswords. We save that history. All of the history and data that gets saved for uh, puzzle solvers is tied to a user account. So we need to um, keep a fresh pool of users at all times with a known state, usually just a clean state so that we can uh, test pr predictably. Um, at the New York Times we have a uh, system whereby uh, we've set up a database uh, that just has test user information, login credentials and cookies. Uh, so we can use that API to create accounts, and then later on, uh, during testing, the automation suite can check out a user, which locks it for any other tests. We log in with the user, play the crossword or whatever, and then we wipe the user history, and then we check the user back in so that other tests can now use that user. Um, this is a database uh, picture here. We started implementing this with just a flat file uh, with JSON. So it, you, if you don't want to spin up a new database, it, you can, there are other ways to do this. Um, but it, it, this works for us, and we really like it because we don't want to be slowed down by user cruft, right? That feels shameful. Um, race conditions. Uh, everyone knows that Timing is everything when you're automating something through a browser using WebDriver. Um, so it, just as an example, I showed you this little milestone before, the little, here it comes, bam, firework. These are not the right answers, by the way. <laughs> but that little, that halfway, that thing, we need to test that that's there. That's an element on the DOM. Um, and so we, we have a web driver go in, go la, 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 and then we look for that element. And that's fine if we're working locally because the element is there for a second, we see it in the DOM, and then we pass the test. What could go wrong? What could go wrong is WebDriver is a web server. It's trying to talk to some browser somewhere. If that's on our local, it could be quick. Um, if that's on a VM in the cloud, that network traffic could take more than a second. It could take more than the time uh, it takes for that animation to live and go away. So uh, here in WebDriver, we fill in the puzzle halfway, and that causes that little firework explosion to happen. Right at that point, WebDriver is checking for that animation element. That request goes over the wire, it might go up to the Sauce Labs cloud, and by that time, if the element is gone, it's gonna wait and wait and wait, um, and then it's going to come back and say, sorry, that animation never fired. Even though it did, we just missed it. So how do we fix that? We put a little memory in the browser. Uh, basically, we use a browser.execute to set up an array on the window object, 
and uh, we add event listeners to our application. And any time an animation fires, uh, the entire animation event is pushed onto the array so that later we can say, oh, excuse me, uh, browser, uh, could you point me to your window object and tell me what's in this array of events? And it'll say, yes, here you go. And in that array, we'll find the little animation event and we'll say, there it was. We saw it, test passes. Here comes the code. So, Okay, yeah, that's big enough. You can probably read this. So you can see here, it's a, a browser.execute. We use webdriver.io, but any web driver library has the capability to execute JavaScript on the page. Um, we're just adding these, uh, we're adding attract events array to the window, essentially. And then uh, you can see here on line uh, five through nine, we're setting up the config for the types of uh, events and mutations that we wanna listen to. Starting on uh, 10 through 18, we're writing the callback uh, that we're going to uh, have the event listener use. Uh, basically, any time a child list or attributes change occurs, we push that event onto the array. Uh, and then we just hang it on the window observer object. Um, so that later, we can say, uh, check out window.tractEvents see if this uh, animation event mutation was in there, and if it was, then at some point, we saw that animation. And since we're only testing the one thing in this one test that the animation appeared, we know that that's a good sign. We've got our animation. Uh, using mock data, so uh, speaking of controversial subjects, uh, when we test puzzles, there's a new puzzle every day, of course. Uh, so uh, there are cases where we want the puzzle that we load on the page to be predictable. Um, it could be that we're working on a new feature where API development is not complete. Uh, we could be looking for broken puzzle states where uh, the pu puzzle answer is something crazy, like la 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 la, something like that. Or we need to set up visual diff states. Uh, and we, we know that we could flake our visual diff tests if we rely on um, some puzzle date or the puzzle looking the same on any given date. Or we wanna set up a puzzle that was made by Grandmaster Flash and edited by Will Ferrell instead of Will Shorts, as we're wont to do. Uh, so uh, our team wrote a library to do this. All of our games, all of our puzzles are React applications. Um, and they run on an Express server which talks to a Go backend. So we wrote a middleware for Express. Um, it's called Express Sidetrack. It's uh, internal for now, where it's sort of insourcing it. Um, there is no roadmap for the product, but it, once we come up with a roadmap, open sourcing it will be on the roadmap, so stay tuned, I guess. But uh, the idea is that this is a way for us to deliver mock data into our program. Essentially, it, uh, it sits on your Express server and listens. Um, if you set up a cookie in your browser that says, uh, uh, that has a real API route and then a route to uh, mock data CDN, the middleware will kick in and say, hey, instead of getting the puzzle for, uh, what is today, April 25th, get the puzzle for the 4th of July or whatever mock data we point it to. And in this way, we can inject mock data of any kind that we want into our page. Uh, I wouldn't recommend this for every one of your tests, especially if you're talking about end-to-end -end tests through the browser. This is really testing components, right? You're not testing that you're integrating with a real API. Um, as mentioned in the previous talk, this sets up a lot of mock data, uh, test fixtures, and these become first-class code. You need to commit these with your source code. So if that's not what you're into, then you might not want to rely too heavily on this method. Um, the middleware has to be installed on the application under test. So if you're on a team where you, the software engineer in test, don't have access to the application code, this might not be a good fit for you. But that's a bad situation and that you should turn that around before you try to turn this around. Uh, you need to be able to access uh, APIs and production code uh, and don't take no for an answer. Uh, you could consider using an external proxy. People use uh, Browsy Mob, uh, brow what is it? Brow what? Mob, there's some proxy that people use. What's the Java one? Do you know? Okay. Browser mob? Yeah, that's the one. Uh, people use that. Uh, or you could just, it's, if it's a web application, you could just uh, change the DOM and inject your own data right into the components. There are many ways to go about this. We happen to use an Express uh, middleware. Uh, and so, <laughs> reliab reliability uh, on the game's web team is better now, we're getting better. We've taken some of the shame that we had around our flaky tests 
uh, and our dumb tests, and we've busted that shame. Um, tests also need to be really quite fast. Uh, if tests run too long, it affects the developer feedback cycle, and developers aren't going to want to add long-running tests to their most frequently running suites. Um, regression testing applications, I've heard people say it takes uh, days to weeks on their teams. Um, it, it, people want to be able to make ch quick changes to their code, but they can't do it without the test causing their attention to fall apart. Uh, test timeouts could kick in. Your test could run so long that Selenium could think that your test failed because of it. These are not great feelings. These make you feel gross inside. They're shameful feelings, and we want to bust that shame. One thing that we do uh, for the New York Times crossword, most of the time we turn off ads. Uh, the New York Times runs a lot of JavaScript heavy ads that take forever to load on our pages. They just add seconds to our tests. So unless we're testing something where uh, we want to verify that the ad is not interfering with something on the page, we just turn it off. I work with developers to uh, add a, a, another sort of a cookie listener. If a cookie exists that says disable ads on our staging environments, the ads are disabled. And we sped up uh, a great amount because of that. Uh, probably a 30 to 40% performance increase in our tests. The grid itself is tough. Uh, here's the grid. You, you guys have all seen a crossword puzzle before. These can be made up of anywhere between 144 to 225 cells. And each of these cells is a web element that contains other web elements. You've got the cell itself. The color of the cell could be like a black cell or a, a blue highlighted cell. You've got the little number in the corner. And you've got an answer, maybe. Even if there is no answer, you've got the placeholder for an answer in each cell. So it's a ton of web elements. And some test cases that we have require that we validate the state of every, every cell in the grid, of course, because we're testing the state of the puzzle. Um, this led to some slowness. Uh, remember all those uh, web traffic calls that WebDriver is making? If we get all the cells, that's one call. It returns one big web element. And locally, that took about 100 milliseconds. That's great performance. Uh, when we try to get just the answer text from each cell for, of a 255 cell grid, we're multiplying that by the amount of cells. One web driver test in itself is not running those requests in parallel. It's sequential. Get me a cell, get me a cell, get me a cell. So it's, it took uh, 22 seconds. Uh, when we tried it on Sauce VMs, uh, this, the order of magnitude is an estimation, but it's not far off. It took about 225 seconds. Uh, and given the amount of tests that we have that require us to check the entire grid, that was unacceptable to us. We felt a lot of bad shame around that. We wanted to fix it. Um, you can see here an illustration of what was happening. All that web traffic was taking forever to get back to WebDriver. Um, but if you remember, if you make one call to get one element, that's very fast. And so now what we do is we grab the HTML document from the grid, and then we use a library called Cheerio to convert that locally into a DOM. And then we can inspect that DOM uh, for web elements, and it's a local-to-local -local request, and it's gone much faster for us. Um, the one drawback to this, of course, is that uh, anytime we know that the state of the grid is updated, we need to get that HTML object again and convert it again. We need to stay on top of that. Uh, it's not push-based. We're always pulling that information. But it's fine because it's one request instead of 255 requests. So we've taken a lot of the shame out of our slow tests and busted it. So how are we doing? What work remains? What's next for games at the New York Times? We're going to keep releasing new games, and we're going to keep releasing new features. Uh, and so we know that we need to stay on top of automation. Um, we're, we've been measuring our progress. I mentioned before that we cover, uh, we measure our test coverage um, pretty accurately. Jest has great uh, unit test coverage reporting tools. Uh, our narrative test cases are stored in TestLink, which you might have heard of. I'm not a huge fan, but it is what it is. And we're able to generate reports from that. And uh, comparing that to our, um, our canon of tests, uh, we're able to get sort of a hybrid stat. It's not perfect. Uh, we'll never really know that all of our requirements are covered, because it's a tough problem to solve. But uh, we know that we have good feelings now. We, we know that our regression cycle has decreased. We know that we have less bugs just before a launch. And um, we, while we're not great at capturing numbers for those metrics, the, the culture is there. It, we're on an upswing uh, because of these practices. 
Um, so it couldn't, we couldn't have done it without support from product ownership. There needs to be buy-in from the top in order to get uh, the test culture turned around on your team. Um, I was lucky that uh, when I joined this team, the developers were, themselves were clamoring for uh, automation. And so it, it wasn't a hard sell to get everyone on board and not only um, embracing the test culture, but working to write tests. Uh, we consider test effort during estimation uh, at every layer. And uh, we understand that the upfront cost of test automation is worth it in the end. We're seeing benefits now. Uh, we're not perfect. The members on this team have different comfort levels writing end-to-end -end tests. Uh, it's a new practice for some people. Um, all of our features, as I mentioned, ship with great unit test coverage. Some of them don't have perfect end-to-end uh, -end or browser-based coverage, but those uh, stories do get prioritized in the backlog, and we always come back and close those gaps. We're not great at capturing our uh, return on investment, uh, as I mentioned, and our tests still flake out sometimes, because tests do that. I, there was a headline maybe a year ago from Google about how Google handles their flaky tests, and I just, it made me breathe a sigh of relief, because if the high and mighty Google is dealing with flaky tests, then it's okay that me, uh, a crossword guy, am also dealing with flaky tests. Uh, software testing is a process of continuous shame elimination. So if you're feeling any sort of shame in your uh, software delivery uh, processes, your software development, um, think about the four R's. Think about the Ghostbusters. Think about how you're going to bust that shame. Uh, and that's it for me. That's all I had lined up. Those are all my slides. And now if you have any questions, I'll answer those. If you've got a question, please raise your hand, and I will bring the mic to you. I'm intrigued by your last point about uh, speeding up tests with Cheerio. Mm -hmm. I was uh, wondering if uh, there's a, if you've got an example online somewhere. If I've gotten, oh, um, I mean, we've only ever done it in the crossword uh, app. So that, I mean, that's a closed repo, but I sh that's a good idea. Putting together a public example of that would be a smart thing to do. So, yeah. Um, you know, contact me and I'll put it together and uh, I'll, I'll send it along to you. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that uh, you don't have any tests against production and that you rely fully on customers' complaints or feedback. <laughs> uh -huh. Do you really think this is a good practice? Um, I do think it's a good practice. I, we, um, we're at a place where the, the, our staging and test environments are, uh, the data is so close to our production environments that the level of testing that we do has been sufficient for us to release uh, with relatively few surprises. Um, we also have uh, really good continuous integration in place. Anytime anything does come up on production, uh, rather than roll back, we generally develop a fix and push it right away. Uh, we don't have a lot of governance problems with pushing stuff to production. Um, it, I've been at companies where that's really slowed us down before. Uh, if you push something that does break and you suddenly need an emergency release, uh, it, the last thing you want to do is fill out paperwork and go to a VP and say, this is why we need this. This is what we did. <laughs> this is whose fault it is. Um, we, we try to move fast so that when we do blow something up, which will inevitably happen someday, we can unexplode it just as quickly. Uh, I think we're out of time. And you can find Greg in the back getting demiked. Um, and as you exit, um, lunch is being served in the Texas Ballroom. And it starts at 12.05 and goes until 1.05. And we'll see you back here for afternoon sessions starting at 1.10. Where you join me here, you'll see Mural's journey to CICD and continuous testing. So thanks everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you.